Hello ATS 113 students, this is Dr. John Schrage. I'm sorry I wasn't able to be in class today, unfortunately bad timing with regard to some travel, but that's okay. We're going to just do a quick lecture with a little PowerPoint presentation, cover a little bit of material, and then we'll get to know each other in the next class. I want to just do a quick little overview here of the atmosphere. Uh, we're going to be talking so much about the atmosphere in this course. We're going to be learning so much about weather, but it's always important to keep in mind that compared to the size of the Earth, the atmosphere is very, very small. Your textbook has this little analogy they like to draw that if the Earth were the size of an apple, the atmosphere would only be about the size of the skin of the apple. So the atmosphere is very small compared to the overall size of the ap of the Earth. In fact, it's kind of silly to talk about a how big about how big the atmosphere is because there really isn't a top. Rather, the atmosphere just gets thinner and thinner the farther you get from the Earth's surface. There are some figures here that I got from your textbook saying that, for example, 90% of the mass of the atmosphere is below 16 kilometers, 99% uh, of the mass of the atmosphere is below 50 kilometers, and so on. Would you be expected to know these exact numbers? No, of course not. But this idea that there really isn't a well-defined top to the atmosphere, the atmosphere just gets thinner and thinner, even space isn't entirely empty. Uh, tells us, though, that almost the entire mass of the atmosphere is concentrated right down here in the part of the atmosphere where we live. Okay, it's no big surprise the atmosphere is made up of air. Air isn't a very scientific term, but it gives us a sense about the fact that we're talking about not a substance, we're talking about a mixture of solids and liquids and gases. Uh, we'll come back to this business about how the liquids and the solids of the atmosphere are called aerosols in just a little bit. But in the meantime, I want to focus on the fact that air is a mixture. Think about the think about Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid is a mixture of sugar and flavors and water and food coloring. And when you mix it all together, it makes Kool-Aid. But in fact, it's all still sugar and water and food coloring. It is a mixture. They haven't actually chemically changed, they're just all blended together. And that's the way the atmosphere is too. There's all these different gases and solids and liquids suspended in those gases, but they haven't chemically changed, they're just mixed together. Each of these gases has what we call a source, or multiple sources, and a sink, or multiple sinks. Sources are processes that add a gas to the atmosphere. These are, uh, the verb is that they input these gases to the atmosphere at some input rate. Similarly, a sink is a process that removes gases from the atmosphere. We, use, we say that it outputs the gas from the atmosphere. It's probably easiest to think about sources and sinks of gases in, in the context of a particular common gas, that is water vapor. So for example, for water vapor, the source of water vapor for the atmosphere is evaporation. Liquid water on the surface of the Earth evaporates, adding water vapor to the atmosphere. How fast does that happen? At the input rate of water vapor. There are sinks of water vapor in the atmosphere too. These are processes that remove water vapor from the atmosphere. In the case of water vapor, it is condensation. Water vapor in the atmosphere condenses into liquid water drops that then fall out as rain. How fast does that happen? At the output rate. That's kind of a philosophical thing there. We'll talk, obviously, in great detail in the class about the processes that produce rain and so on. We're just sort of thinking about this in a very simple level here. So gases are added to the atmosphere at an input rate by the sources. The gases are removed from the atmosphere at an output rate by the sinks. That means that there's a certain amount of each gas in the atmosphere at any given time. We call that the reservoir of the gas. So every gas has a certain amount of it that's currently being held in the atmosphere. We call that the reservoir. It's usually measured in units of mass, like tons or uh, yeah, kilograms or something like that. The residence time is how long each individual molecule of gas will typically be in the atmosphere before being removed by the sink. And there's a, an equation right here. Now, we very rarely in ATS-113 work with the equations, but there really isn't a way to avoid it in this particular case. The residence time, the typical lifetime of a molecule of a gas in the atmosphere, is just the size of the reservoir divided by the input rate. This is actually a very important little concept, so let's spend some time thinking about some examples of it. How about the case of water vapor? Now in the case of water vapor, we're going to learn in a little bit that not very much of the Earth's atmosphere is made up of water vapor, typically less than 1%. The reservoir, the number of kilograms or tons or whatever unit you want to use of water vapor in the atmosphere is just not that big compared to other gases. On the other hand, the input is very, very fast. 
there's lots of evaporation going on off the oceans of the earth and uh, evapotranspiration happening off of plants so there is a fairly fast input rate so you have a small reservoir divided by a large input rate you're gonna get a very small number for the residence time and in practice the residence time of water vapor is pretty short about 10 days on average that means that a typical water vapor molecule that evaporates off the ocean someplace on the earth will spend on average about 10 days in the atmosphere before it condenses out into liquid water and falls to the surface as rain that's relatively short as residence times of a gas go let's try a second example how about oxygen now the reservoir of oxygen is comparatively large as we'll see in just a little bit about 20 21 percent of the earth's atmosphere is oxygen on the other hand the input rate is also fairly fast uh, this would mostly be photosynthesis in plants that is the source of oxygen into the atmosphere it's, it's fairly fast but not as fast as say the evaporation of water so you have a fairly large number uh, divided by a fairly large input rate and as a consequence the residence time of oxygen is fairly moderate yeah if you actually plug in the numbers of how many kilograms of oxygen there is in the atmosphere divided by the input rate you'll get a time of about 500 years a typical oxygen molecule will be added to the atmosphere by photosynthesis of plants and spend about 500 years in the atmosphere before it is removed from the atmosphere by respiration in animals or by combustion in fires. We'll talk about the sources and sinks of oxygen in just a little bit. Let's do one more example here, the residence time of nitrogen. Now the reservoir of nitrogen is huge. About 78% of the Earth's atmosphere is nitrogen. So there are a lot of nitrogen in the Earth's atmosphere. On the other hand, the input rate of nitrogen is very, very slow. It's produced by certain bacteria, and that's about it. So there's a very big number on the top of this fraction as the reservoir divided by a very small number for the input rate. And as a consequence, the residence time of nitrogen is extremely long. It's about 42 million years. A typical nitrogen molecule then that has been added to the atmosphere has been in the at will be in the atmosphere for about 42 million years before various process, chemical processes and biological processes will remove it from the air. Now this concept of residence time is pretty important because it really helps us to explain the difference between two types of gases in our atmosphere. Each of these gases, we're going to use the word constituent to describe them. There's a whole series of constituents. There are going to be the constant constituents and the variable constituents. Constant constituents occur at about the same concentration at every location in the atmosphere. It doesn't matter if you're at the top of the mountain or the bottom of a valley, if you're in the United States or China or the middle of the ocean, there's going to be about the same amount of that gas. Variable constituents, on the other hand, occur at a range of concentrations depending on where you are or when you are in the atmosphere. Maybe there's a lot of this gas in the winter, or maybe there's a very little of this gas at the top of a mountain or something like that. So we have this idea of constant constituents. They're going to be some of these gases, and they're going to be in a concentration that's in steady state. It doesn't mean that there aren't sources and sinks of these gases. It's that the amount at which these gases are being added to the atmosphere is in, constant, is in some sense in equilibrium with the weight at which it's being removed so that the concentration of the gas stays pretty steady. If the residence time of the gas is quite long, there's plenty of time for the gases to blend. There might be more plants over this area and less plants over that area, but there's the oxygen lasts a certain amount of time in the atmosphere, and it's a pretty long amount of time, like 500 years. So the winds will have plenty of time to mix the oxygen-rich areas with the oxygen-poor areas, so that in pretty much any time you look at the atmosphere, there's the same amount of oxygen everywhere. It's had plenty of time to mix because the atmosphere holds its oxygen for a fairly long period of time. That's not the case of a variable constituent like water vapor, where the relatively short lifetime means that it doesn't have enough time for the water, the atmosphere doesn't have enough time for water rich areas where it's humid to mix the air with areas that are water poor and the air is dry and as a consequence we have places where their air is dry and the air is moist. We have variable, uh, water vapor is a variable constituent. Well let's take a look at some of the concentrations here of the constant constituents of the atmosphere. By far your largest constant constituent is nitrogen. N2, diatomic nitrogen. I have a little pie chart that I made down there in the bottom, and you can see that about 78% of Earth's atmosphere is nitrogen. 